Well, friends, Tim Walz, the Democratic choice for Vice President, Kamala Harris's choice for Vice President, claims to be a Lutheran. Is he? Well, uh, we know he's definitely a part of the sea beast described in Revelation 13, otherwise known as corrupt government. You know, the one that the earth beast, a.k.a. the religion of man, wants the people of the earth to worship. We know he's part of that. We're talking about his claim today on the show, as well as answering a viewer's question about Revelation 13, 17, and showing how the mark of the beast has been with us since the apostles. It's coming up right here, right now, on The Truth at All Costs. Cat Garrett 736 commented on my reaction to John Rich's video where he rightly denounced the John Darby teaching of the rapture and then also made some passing comment about the Rothschilds. She says, I don't usually comment, but being ignorant of the globalist agenda, Rothschilds coming new world order is not a badge of godliness, but rather having one's head stuck in the sand. These things are not myths and failure to understand what is going on does not make one more godly. I never said being ignorant of conspiracy theories makes me godlier than anyone else, but I do think scripture backs up that it's a waste of our ever loving time, friend. Check out last week's episode of Truth at All Costs, where I discussed this very topic for an entire hour. The link is in the description of the show. If you're new around here, friends, I'm Reverend Tyrell Bramwell. I'm the pastor of St. Mark Lutheran Church in Ferndale, California, where we are a millennialist, all millennialists, in keeping with the apostolic tradition recorded in the scriptures and handed down to the church throughout all the generations. Whether you're a friend or a foe, on this podcast, you get straight talk about the culture from the Christian perspective. No pandering, no placating, no politically correct lies that aid in the devil's murderous ways. No, sir, we're Christians, and our aim is to be faithful to the whole counsel of God's word, understanding the spirit of our day, and therefore, therefore, upon what battlefield we are fighting. We work toward peace if possible, it is true, but speak the truth at all costs. So, Kamala Harris has selected a Lutheran to be her VP running mate. Is that right? Is that true? Well, no, actually, no, it's not. I mean, yes, the media is quoting that Minnesota's governor, Tim Walls, identified Pilgrim Lutheran Church in St. Paul, Minnesota as his parish. That is true. And I know this assembly of people uses both the word Lutheran and church in their title, but they are neither one. Pilgrim Lutheran Church is part of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and this sect has repeatedly shown itself to be a false religion filled with false prophets who walk around in sheep's clothing despite being ravenous wolves. Long ago, the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, rejected what the Bible is, that the Bible is the inspired, inerrant Word of God. So, they could embrace the ways of the world. So they could embrace Satan. That's the truth. Elizabeth Eaton, who goes by the title of Bishop of the ELCA, despite being disqualified from being able to be ordained as an under-shepherd of Christ for the same reason that the bio biological males who beat up women in the 2024 Olympics should have been disqualified from bloodying the faces of women. Yes, they're the wrong sex. Eaton is the wrong sex. She is not only a wolf in sheep's clothing, leading people away from the one true God of the Bible, she is also quite literally a woman in men's clothing, wearing the clerical uniform, wearing the vestments that only a man should be wearing. And it's not new for the ELCA to fill their ministerium with disqualified people. The man-made practice of quote-unquote, ordaining women, has been going on in the ELCA since the 1970s. This ordaining of homosexuals and transgender people followed the ordaining of women, bringing them into the Lord's holy work, the Lord's ministry, as if it was something that could be done. But it's not. This is a wayward church, and it does not 
deserve and rightly cannot properly be considered a church. It's par for the course for this largest sect that illicitly bears Luther's name in America to claim all the things they claim. They've been running rampant, and they got the majority of the press machine working with them because they are the largest, quote-unquote, Lutheran denomination in America. And so they have the momentum of being the largest, that claim. And so most of the time when you hear about Lutherans in the news, you hear about this heretical, sectarian group of people. What Reverend Dr. David Scare of Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana, says in his new book, you've heard me talk about it before on the show, Without the Shedding of Blood, There Is No Forgiveness, is absolutely true. Let me, uh, let me put this up on the screen for you. Today, he says, Luther survives as a historical and cultural marker without the annoying edges that his children find embarrassing. Let me say that again. Luther survives as a historical and cultural marker, and that's about it, without the annoying edges that his children find embarrassing. This is the way the ELCA uses Luther. It's also the way they use Christ. The Christian name is part of that so-called church, but only a Christ that has no rough edges, only a Christ that has no law to speak a Christ that does not call to repentance, a Christ that does not come to meet sinners and then tells them, go and sin no more. Only a Christ that is made in man's image or woman's image, (laughs) They, you know, to to speak kindly toward the ELCA, they would want me to make sure I I divide that. Don't speak of man as all of mankind, as human history has always done, but make sure we, we speak of womankind. That way when we say amen, we can also say a women, and all this nonsense. They are on the front lines of the nonsense. So to call Tim Walls' church Lutheran would be like calling Joe Biden the president. The actual reality doesn't match the title. Yes, yes, the title is there. But the reality is that it is an empty title. It is void and, and empty. It is vacuous. There is no reality there. Tim Walls is not a Lutheran. He may call himself one, but he also calls himself a wartime veteran, and he calls himself a friend to children and says things uh, like, one man's socialism is another man's neighborliness. Have you seen this? And for one thing, don't ever ever shy away from our progressive values. One person's socialism is another person's neighborliness. Just do the damn work. This is a shocking and insulting comment by the would-be vice president of the United States of America, spoken as only a soft and spoiled coward could speak. It's a shocking statement for anyone who understands what socialism leads to. Now, I'm a fan of Reverend Richard Wormbrand. Now, I, I know many other Lutherans in America aren't, and there's some conversations that we could be had somewhere else in another time. He's the founder of The Voice of the Martyrs. And and given that he was a Lutheran pastor, and this is where confessional Lutherans start to get a little uneasy about what type of Lutheran even Richard Wormbrand was, um, but he learned at least this, and we can celebrate him and acknowledge him for at least this. He learned firsthand about Tim Walls' ideas of neighborliness. I want to share share with you this amazing excerpt from his very popular little book called Tortured for Christ. Take a look at this, friends. Wormbrand says, my second imprisonment, yes, this man was in prison for 14 years in the gulag. My second imprisonment was in many ways worse than the first. I knew well what to expect. My physical condition became very bad almost immediately. But we continued the work of the underground church where we could, and that is, in communist prisons. It was strictly forbidden to preach to other prisoners, as it is in captive nations still to this day. It was understood that whoever was caught doing this received a severe beating. A number of us decided to pay the price for the privilege of preaching, so we accepted their terms. It was a deal. We preached, and they beat us. We were happy to be preaching. They were happy 
beating us. So everyone was happy. (laughs) The following scene, he says, happened more times than I can remember. A brother was preaching to the other prisoners when the guards suddenly burst in, surprising him halfway through a phrase. They hauled him down the corridor to the beating room. After what seemed like an endless beating, they brought him back and they threw him in, bloody and bruised, on the prison floor. Slowly, he picked up his battered body, painfully straightened his clothing and said, Now, brethren, where did I leave off when I was interrupted? (laughs) He continued his gospel message. And then Reverend Wormbrand says, I have seen beautiful things. I have seen beautiful things. That is an amazing, inspiring, encouraging scene, no doubt. Both socialism and neighborliness were at play in the gulag. They were, but they were not one and the same. The former led to the beating of neighbor. The latter, well, it was derived from the Christian love of neighbor. If Walls attends Pilgrim Lutheran Church. He can be many things, friends, but Christian? Well, only by the grace of God, despite the poop brownies being served to the assembly by spiritual adulterers. But yes, we ought to hold out hope. We ought to hold out hope that knowing, as the the fourth century hammer of the Arians said, the ears of the people are holier than the hearts of the priests. It is true just as St. Hilary said. So, as we look at Tim Walls, instead of the parish he claims to belong to, not just judging the man by the group, in order to discern from externals, which is all we can ever go by, whether or not this man is a Christian, a Lutheran, we see that Hilary was also spot on when he said, who can fail to see here the slimy windings of the serpent's track? the coiled adder with forces concentrated for the spring, concealing the deadly weapon of its poisonous fangs within its folds. It is true. Who doesn't see the track of the devil all over Waltz's, Waltz's, however you'd say his name, his actions? He lied to steal valor and to pad his resume for political gain, saying he carried guns of war in war. And not only did he put down the rifle that his government gave him to defend his nation, leaving the men under his command vulnerable when they were deployed to war, abandoning his men, but he also put down his Roman 13 sword that God gave him as governor of Minnesota, helping the 2020 BLM rioters Burn down Minneapolis. Romans 13, 3 to 4 says, For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Not only has Walls not carried out God's wrath on the wrongdoers who burned down Minneapolis, but he also shows that he thinks he rules over God's decree by aiding and abetting lawbreakers who come into America illegally. He signed into law legislation to pay for the crimes, the criminals, excuse me, (laughs) and their crimes, who broke into our country so they could have health care and, and for them to be eligible to go to college for free in Minnesota. Very neighborly, Tim. Let's steal the tax dollars from legal citizens and, and give the money to illegal citizens. Very neighborly indeed. Socialism is here, friend, already. It's not coming. It is here. But how will they get to class, you might wonder. I I mean, Governor Walls is going to pay for them to go to school, but how are they going to get to class? Well, see, in Minnesota, when you commit the crime of breaking and entering, illegally coming into America, 
well, wrongdoer walls, he'll give you a driver's license. Yes, driver's licenses for non-citizens, for illegal immigrants. But we're just getting started. We're just getting started on this man's defiance of God, of his breaking of God's law and, and the rejection of his vocation as a governor. Instead of just putting down the sword God entrusted to him, he actually misuses it to stab babies in the brain and to chop off their limbs until dead. Wait, what? Yes. In 2023, Tim Walls signed into law a bill that grants as a quote-unquote fundamental right the ability for Minnesotans to murder babies up to birth. No questions asked. Now, that doesn't seem very Christian does it? That doesn't seem very neighborly even, does it? Killing your neighbor is not very neighborly, and it's not very Christian, according to the fifth commandment and what Christ teaches us to be and to do for our neighbors as his people, as representatives of him. May we always remember even our governing authorities, if they say they are Christian, are representing Christ, and that doesn't stop just because they sit in some mansion somewhere. No. They are to bring their Christian identity with them into their office for the sake of their neighbors, and especially for the sake of witnessing Christ to their neighbors, to be Christ to neighbor. But it is all of this evil that Walls continues to commit. It is very ELCA, absolutely. It is very Evangelical Lutheran Church in America behavior. So, does, does the bill that he signed into law that turned Minnesota into a refuge state for confused kids preyed upon by big medicine that wants to siphon money from them their entire lives after their gender reassignment surgeries and chemical castrations leave them perpetually injured and, and in need of physical aid? This, does this sound like neighborliness too? Does this sound like Christian behavior to, to queer God's order? to be working toward the, 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 the confusion and, and the, the evil of butchering and, and castrating people's bodies, helping them hurt themselves. That is not Christian at all. And so, saints, since we're called to use the reason that God gives us, specifically to identify leaven so that we can keep it away from contaminating the whole lump of the church, with what we've been given to consider we can say that Tim Walls is not a Lutheran, regardless of what he claims to identify as. And that, that is straight up truth. And speaking of truth, if you want to learn more about those who bear the name of truth, that is the name of Christ, Christians, and then misuse that holy name to peddle the Marxist religion of the Democrat Party, well, I can't recommend Megan Basham's new book, Shepherds for Sale, enough. I've included the bookshop.org link in the description so you can grab a copy for yourself and learn how not just politicians like Tim Walls lie about who they are, but also how evangelical leaders traded the truth for a leftist agenda. Just select Butterfat Books as the local bookstore that you want to support. That's the Bramwell Family Bookstore, my bookstore my, that my wife runs uh, every single day here on Main Street in Ferndale. And, and then you can place your order just like that, and you can order any book you want. I appreciated, in particular, Molly Ziegler Hemingway's back cover endorsement, and so maybe you will too. Take a look at this. Over the past several decades, the political left has taken a long march through America's most important institutions. While the political takeover of the media, universities, and the bureaucracy have been examined by many, the coordinated takeover attempt of evangelical Christianity is one of the left's most insidious and least discussed schemes. With her keen journalistic eye, rigorous investigatory skills, and riveting storytelling, Basham is finally dragging this plot out into the light, exposing how corrupted and vainglorious leaders tricked evangelicals into betraying their doctrines to help accomplished left-wing political goals. Subscribe to the channel, friends, if you haven't already. So that you can uh, and, and make sure you click that church bell, that notification bell, so you're notified when I post my Butterfat Books review of this important book, Shepherds for Sale, How Evangelical Leaders Traded the Truth for a Leftist 
lie. And speaking of unfaithful evangelical pastors, I don't know if it's Megan Basham's book or the hundreds of comments posted on recent videos here on the channel that have that has refreshed my gratitude, let's say it that way, to God for saving me, not only from my sins by the blood of Christ, but also from American evangelicalism. The comments I've been seeing on, on the John Rich reaction videos especially, man, there are some awful pastors out there teaching Christians some horrible things, be it online or in person. True story. True story. But thankfully, not all the comments, not all of them are bonkers. For instance, this one from Christy Bello, this one's not bonkers at all. She posted, hello, pastor. God bless. In minute 640 of the reaction to the Revelation music video, when you explain the orthodox view, there's still Revelation 13, 17 to happen before Jesus' coming. Therefore, not all prophecies have been accomplished. Well, thanks uh, for watching and for posting, Christy, Christy Bello. First of all, let me address a possible bit of confusion. You capitalized the word orthodox in your comment, and, and that would be referencing an official branch of the Christian church, right? It, I was speaking of the Orthodox church with a, a lowercase o, uh, meaning the true, faithful, correct, straight church teachings, orthodoxy, uh, not like the Eastern Orthodox or the Greek Orthodox. That'd be a capital O if you're talking about them. So just to be clear about that. But as to your comment, let's look at Revelation 13, and, and hopefully uh, we can straighten out some of the things that you've been taught and, and help you figure out how to rightly, historically, apostolically, biblically look at Revelation 13. Let's get into this right here. We'll start uh, with verse 16, actually. Also, it, and that would be the earth beast from verse 11 above, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or on the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom, John tells us. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Now, thankfully, each of us, each of us is not left to our own devices to read and interpret Scripture. No matter how many people cite their visions in the comment section of these videos uh, as, as the deciding factor of how they read the Bible or understand it, uh, no, we can and should look at what other Christians throughout history, what the church throughout history has said about the part of Scripture that we're studying and, and how it relates to all of Scripture so that we make sure we're not off base or being led astray by this teacher online or that teacher in that weird Assemblies of God church or something like this. Uh, no, let's let's do that today. We want to make sure we're, we're looking at the text in light of what the church has always taught. I have two brilliant, brilliant dead theologians to share with you today and, and a few other uh, examples of well along the way, but we're going to let two of these guys drive our conversation. First is St. Hippolytus, who lived from about 170 to 235 AD, very early in the church history, the church's history. When, when he taught on the mark of the beast, this here, this is what he had to say. Being full of guile and exalting himself against the servants of God with the wish to afflict them and persecute them out of the world because they do not give glory to him, he will order incense pans to be set up by all everywhere, that no one among the saints, that would be Christians, may, able, may be able to buy or sell without first sacrificing. Who's he talking about here? He's talking about the, the, the authority, the Caesar, the king, the sea beast. This is what is meant by the mark received upon the right hand. And the words on their forehead indicate that all are crowned and put on a crown of fire and not of life, but of death. Now, we'll come back to Hippolytus, but pausing right here, what do we learn? What do we learn already? The, the early church, back in from 170 to 235, 
The early church identified the mark of the beast to be renouncing faith in Christ and proving loyalty to the human king, offering incense, not to Christ, but to the sea beast from the first half of Revelation 13. That is, the governing authorities, the king, the Caesar. Now, Eusebius, he was the bishop of Caesarea, and he lived from around 260 to 339 AD. And he recorded in his church history, which is well-received by all of the church, some amazing information about the persecutions of Christians, especially for our purposes today, the persecutions under Domitian, around 95 AD. Here's what we read. With terrible cruelty, Domitian put to death, without trial, great numbers of men at Rome who were distinguished by family and career and without cause banished many other notables and confiscated their property. Finally, he showed himself Nero's successor in hostility to God. He was the second to organize a persecution against us, that is the church, the Christians, though his father, Vespasian, had no such evil plans. Tradition has it that the apostle and evangelist John was still alive at this time and was condemned to live on the island of Patmos for his testimony to the divine word. Writing about the number of the name given the Antichrist in Revelation, Irenaeus says this about John in book 5 of his Against Heresies. This is Irenaeus. Had it been necessary to announce his name clearly at the present time, it would have been stated by the one who saw the revelation, John. For it was seen not long ago, but nearly in our own time, at the end of Domitian's reign. So a quick pop over to Fox's Book of Martyrs, if you're familiar with that, and we can read regarding the Domitian persecution of the church that Christians brought before the tribunal, they were, they were never spared from punishment without renouncing Christ as Lord. That was, that was required to avoid the, the torture and the, and the punishment. This evil tyranny, friend, it didn't just pop up in the first century, though, either. Much of the book of Revelation that St. John wrote references the Old Testament, including the book of Daniel, where we read prophecies that were fulfilled with the coming of Antiochus Epiphanes, the king of Syria which is recorded in the historical document of 1 Maccabees, chapter 1, verses 51 to 64 especially. Now, Maccabees is not inspired word of God, but it is historical and it is valuable because of its historicity. And this is what Hippolytus makes reference to when he's talking about the mark of the beast. So back to Hippolytus. For in this way, too, did Antiochus Epiphanes, the king of Syria, the descendant of Alexander of Macedon, and that would be Alexander the Great, devised measures against the Jews. He too, in the exaltation of his heart, issued a decree in those times that, quote, all should set up shrines before their doors and sacrifice, that they should march in procession. <laughs> you gotta love this, guys, given the Paris Olympics. March in procession to the honor of Dionysus, waving chaplets of ivy, and that those who refused obedience should be put to death by strangulation and torture. But he also met his due recompense at the hand of the Lord, the righteous judge and all searching God, for he died devoured by worms. See, Christy Bello, thank you, thank you again for your comments, great comment. The mark of the beast, as it was revealed to St. John, was familiar to God's people. The earth beast of Revelation 13 is corrupted religion. That's what the, the earth beast is. And this corrupted religion, this man-made religion, directs mankind, all the earth, to worship Revelation 13's sea beast. And that is corrupted government. Both religion and government are good the way God ordained it, but they are the inverse that the, that the devil uses in Revelation 13. And so, yes, the mark that restricts the lives of Christians unless they reject Jesus, that makes it to where they can't buy and sell, that they can't have a livelihood, unless they offer incense to Caesar and declare him to be Lord instead of Christ, this has been around for the entirety of the New Testament era. It is not something that we're waiting to happen, have happen. 
It's not like, and this is what I'm going to get at when I when I review or react to that section of Tucker Carlson's interview interview with John Rich. It's not like, oh, finally we have Neuralink or finally we have Apple Pay. And so so now we've come to a time where this can happen. No, it's been happening throughout all of the church's history. Maybe not with technological tools, but the same restriction was happening when you wouldn't offer incense to Caesar and say Caesar is Lord. You weren't able to operate within society. In fact, you were taken away from society and you were fed to lions. It's a modern American evangelical false teaching that convinces people that it is yet to come. This is part of the, the false views of the end times. It's why it's important that we talk about it and that we get a right understanding of Scripture that informs us of the amillennialist perspective, that it is the most appropriate and accurate understanding of the, the last days. And it is, you know, it's because of our American experience that, that the false views of the end, the false view that the mark of the beast hasn't even come yet, can even grow legs and, and start to influence people. Because in America, we haven't, as a church, experienced persecution. And so for us, from our perspective, it seems like in our little bubble here, the, the mark of the beast is yet to be revealed because in our time, in our experience, we haven't been exposed to that so much. Or maybe we have, but we've been shirking the cross. We've been throwing off our confession of Christ to avoid not being able to buy and sell, to be able to continue in society. And now we have pastor types who are really good at justifying going along with evil to avoid the cross. That they would rather preach, you know, have your best life now. God wants you to be comfortable and happy and glorious. He wants you, you know, to have the most beautiful wife and your kids to go play soccer on Sundays instead of come to church. And, and he wants everything to be perfect. He wants you to have you know, wealth and riches and all this stuff. What is that? That's going along with the state, going along with the culture to be able to buy and sell and, and to live this life as a Christian without any persecution, without any suffering. And so, we rightly understand, as Revelation is apocalyptic literature, it is poetic, it is symbolic. He tells us over and over and over again. He even says right here in this chapter that, that we are to see this, the one who has the right understanding. He's saying, hey, think about this in, in symbolism language here. Think about this as, you know, he who has eyes to see and ears to hear, let him hear, kind of a thing. It's not literal. It's I'm giving you a, a, a picture that you need to understand if you can figure it out symbolically. He's telling us the mark of the beast is going along with corrupted government and corrupted religion. That's the mark of the beast. And we, I would say in America, many of us, even who call ourselves Christian, are going along with the mark of the beast. We are taking it because we refuse to be hated, to be insulted, to be called whatever bad name they want to call us, Nazi or bigot or racist or anything, because we're standing up on God's word. Because we Rightly, we don't really know it rightly because we in America have this pluralistic society and we have a pluralism of religion as well, pluralism of Christianity, so many different false teachers claiming the truth. And, and my heart goes out to the, to the members of churches because they're being led astray, but they don't know it. And, and, and we're really, as I see in the comments section, we're, we're at war with each other because of this. So anyway, the first century Christian martyrs, they knew they knew the mark of the beast all too well. And that's exactly why St. John was inspired to write about it. That's exactly why we have Revelation 13, including verse 17, to give the church at that time and forevermore, down to our time, courage and strength not to bend the pressure of the corrupt state who would kill Christians, that would kill Christians, unless they rejected Jesus and swore loyalty to Rome. It's exactly why he gave us that word. Not for some future event, but for every moment of our lives for the last 2,000 years. Polycarp was a disciple of John, and Polycarp's martyrdom is in what we call the fourth persecution of the church under Marcus Aurelius Antonius, A.D. 162, shows us the mark of the beast in action and a faithful disciple of John refusing to take it. So let's look at this account as we still have it. It's a great tool to learn about rejecting the mark of the beast and what it all looks like. 
It doesn't have anything to do, not at all have anything to do with Apple Pay or Elon Musk's neural link or barcodes, QR codes or any of that stuff. We read, Herod, the chief of police and his father, Nicetes, met him, met, it, met Polycarp, and transferred him to their carriage. They're arresting him is what's going on here. We're jumping in the middle of the text for the sake of time. Sitting beside him, they tried to persuade him. What harm is there in saying, Lord Caesar, and sacrificing a bit of incense, and so be saved, they asked. At first, Polycarp didn't answer him. But when they persisted, he said, I will not do what you advise. Threats now replaced persuasion, and they ejected him so quickly that he scraped his shin in getting down from the carriage, pushed him around, beating him up. But he walked on briskly to the stadium, as if nothing had happened. There, the noise was so great that no one could be heard. When Polycarp entered the stadium, a voice from heaven said, Be strong and play the man, Polycarp. No one saw the speaker, but many of our people who were there heard the voice. As word spread that Polycarp had been arrested, there was a tremendous roar. When he approached, the proconsul asked him if he were Polycarp. And after he admitted it, he tried to dissuade him, saying, Respect your years. Swear by Caesar's fortune. Recant and say away with the atheists. And that this is a reference to Christians. Christians were considered atheists by the Roman culture because we didn't believe in all of their gods and we didn't do what they wanted us to do. So the reference here, if you don't know, to atheists is it's a, it's a term toward Christians at this time. But Polycarp, he swept his hand across the crowd, sighed, looked to heaven and cried, away with the atheists. Now, who's he talking about? He's talking about all the other. He's talking about actual atheists, those who don't believe in the one true God. But the governor pressed him, take the oath and I will set you free. Curse Christ. But Polycarp replied, for 86 years, I've been Christ's servant and he has never done me wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? But when he persisted, Swear by Caesar's fortune. Polycarp replied, if, if you suppose that I could do this, pretending not to know who I am, well then listen carefully. I am a Christian. And if you wish to learn the teachings of Christianity, choose a day and you'll hear them. Tell me when and where and I'll teach you. <laughs> that's, that's the idea. The proconsul replied, persuade the people. And Polycarp responded to him, you, proconsul, would be worthy of such a discussion, for we have been taught, we Christians, to render appropriate honor to rulers and authorities ordained by God if it does not compromise us. As for the people, I don't feel a defense is appropriate. The proconsul said, I have wild beasts. I'll throw you to them if you don't change your mind. Call them. He replied, for we cannot change our mind from better to worse. But to change from cruelty to justice, this is excellent. Again, he countered, this is the, the proconsul. If you disregard the beasts, I'll have you consumed by fire unless you repent. But Polycarp declared, you threaten a fire that burns for a time and is quickly extinguished. Yet a fire that you know nothing about awaits the wicked in the judgment to come and in eternal punishment. But what are you waiting for? Do what you will. <laughs> Look at the courage, a courage given by knowing scripture. Spoiler alert, the governor, the, the proconsul, uh, he killed Polycarp. But the Christian didn't denounce Jesus. He didn't worship according to man. He didn't offer incense to Caesar and say, uh, you know, blessed is Caesar's fortune and all this kind of stuff. He didn't, he didn't do that. He didn't take the mark of the beast. He didn't use his hand to offer incense. And speaking of government tyranny, October is fast approaching, friends. And that means that St. Mark's second annual Freedom of Conscience and Religious Liberty Conference is coming up quickly, guys. On October 5th, Greg Burt, 
the vice president of the California Family Council, as well as T. Russell Hunter of Abolitionist Rising, will be with us here in Ferndale. CFC is a Christian organization that informs and educates Californians on public policy issues related to life, family, and religious liberty. And it also produces media commentary and legislative alerts, most importantly, and advocacy campaigns to try to uh, lobby for good laws in this tyrannical state. These guys are on the front lines down in Sacramento where the sea beast lives and breathes in this part of the world. Abolitionist Rising, if you're not familiar with them, is a coalition of organizations and individuals who seek to end abortion and the culture of death in America. They do great work. And then Smokin', Smokin' Ken, Smokin' Barbecue is uh, going to be um, catering. That's the word I'm looking for, catering, providing lunch. So if you're out in this area, we'd love to have you. If you're not in the area and you're looking for an added bonus reason to take a vacation to our Victorian village, it is a tourist destination, now you have it. Come check out the Redwoods, you know, come over to the Lost Coast with our empty beaches and enjoy, you know, more of a, a cold, it's not a warm beach, but that haystack rocks and more of that Northwest beach vibe. Uh, and enjoy the company of faithful Christians who refuse to take the mark of the beast and learn Learn from two men who are directly engaged with the American manifestation of the sea beast in our political establishment right now. $25 per person or $50 per household. Next week, I'll have more information on how to buy tickets. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel. And if you're watching on YouTube, click that notification bell. It looks like a church bell so that you know when I post new videos and subscribe or follow on the other podcast platforms as well. So you learn more about how you can get tickets to the second annual Freedom of Conscience and Religious Liberty Conference right here at St. Mark Lutheran Church. Friends, we have a lot more goodness coming your way on the show. Don't think we're about done. But before we let Reverend Lewis Brighton tell us more about the Mark of the Beast from his scholarly commentary on Revelation, first, I want to thank all of you who have joined the YouTube channel already. Not just subscribed, but joined, became members of it. You all helped me make these videos and make these videos better by sharing the cost to produce them. I really appreciate it. Our unashamed underwriters are listed on the screen right now. Thank you guys. And thank you all of our podcast partners as well. We appreciate all of you. And thank you, Ronald MRJ Funk, Robert Lockett, David Lippman, Asa Hoffman, Seth Murray, Isaac Spangler, EP, Brian Yamabe, Baron Albatross, Steve Billings, Ernest Sire, Walter Winkler, Holy Gamer, and our newest podcast producer, Ryan Cunningham. Thank you all. If you're interested in joining the channel like these folks have, Click the link in the description below to learn more. And now to Dr. Lewis Brighton, Reverend Dr. Lewis Brighton. He is a brilliant Revelation scholar, and he was laid to rest, I think, about 10 years ago now, something like that. Uh, but his words live on in the excellent resource from Concordia Publishing House. So let's dig into it right here. The number of the beast, Revelation 13, 18, is perhaps the most perplexing verse in the whole of Revelation. However, for John, the author, this was evidently not so. For he says that just as anyone who has ears should hear, whoever has the intelligence should figure out the number of the beast, for it is a human number. 1318. Not everyone would have this intelligence and ability, but evidently some do or did. Those who were versed in Demetria, is that how you say that, guys? Gematria? Gematria? Could figure out the number of the beast, if that were the method John had in mind. But was it? That's the question. Sweet suggests that this intelligence, this wisdom, Sophia, in 1318, is apparently the spiritual gift answering to the gift of apocalypsis, revelation. In Ephesians 117, Paul, in his prayer for the believers in Ephesus, asks that God would grant them the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in their knowledge of him, Jesus Christ. And there's the Greek for you if you're reading on the screen. The wisdom and intelligence that John speaks of is the knowledge and revelation of Christ, which a person can understand only by the aid of the Spirit. Whether or not it involves a particular cryptographic hermeneutic like Demetria, he evidently expects those who have such knowledge and spiritual wisdom to exercise it. So the number of the beast 
is a human number. Revelation 13, 18 says that is a number that is related to or represents human life or existence, perhaps even a number that can be understood and inter interpreted by wisdom available to human beings. For the number 666 is expressed in human language and words. See how we can read that? It doesn't necessarily have to be talking about a number designated to a person, but Dr. Brighton's going to give us some information on that too. But here there is a right understanding that you can rightly understand it as it is a number understandable by humans. And so a human number. Furthermore, since man was created on the sixth day, Genesis 1, 26 to 31, the number six could represent humanity and anything of the human nature, just as the number seven represents God. Thus, 666 would represent and point to one particular individual. The person most commonly accepted is that of Nero. Yet, the numerical value of the Greek letters of Nero Caesar is not 666, but rather 1005. If Nero Caesar is transliterated into Hebrew characters, then the total would be 666. If this is the solution, only a part of John's recipients could have solved this cryptogram. If Nero is the particular person to whom the number 666 cryptically refers, he is the type or model of what the beast really represents, and he is not the final fulfillment, for he had been dead around 20 years already when John wrote Revelation. Interesting fact, right? Nero could serve as one example of what the beasts represent, all anti-Christian forces. But as a type, the deeper significance of the number is that which it typifies, the unholy trinity of the dragon, from Revelation 12, the beast from the sea, 13, 1 to 10, and religious beast from the earth, 13, 11 to 18. In the context of chapter 13, the number is the number of the beast from the earth, the second beast. Nevertheless, the number applies also to the dragon and to the first beast, the beast from the sea. The number applies to all three members of the unholy trinity, especially to whichever one is most active and most prominent at any given time and in any given situation. If the number 777 were to be used, it would refer to the Holy Trinity, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This evil trinity, 666, apes the Holy Trinity, 777, but always falls short and fails. The wisdom Ha Sophia, referred to at the beginning of 1318, is then the wisdom that comes from God and enables the Christian to know and understand what this unholy trinity is and represents at any given time here on earth. This wisdom enables the Christian to discern how the evil forces of the dragon, both secular and religious, are always and everywhere active at war to destroy the church and her witness to Christ. Such wisdom comes only from God, but it is a wisdom that he graciously and richly confers on all his people in Christ. Christy Bello, I truly hope this helps you see that the mark of the beast is not an outstanding prophecy. The church has been refusing this mark since the time of the apostles and the persecution of Nero. And we can see how Nero, if he's already been dead as a type, he is, he'd suffered the mortal wound, the first wave of persecution ended, but now at the same time of John, as, as Irenaeus is talking about, as Eusebius records, we see Domitian rising up. And so he emerges, you thought the threat was done, Nero was dead, but now here he is again. And we see the type and the pattern that continues all throughout the church and her history. That's it, friends, for today. And so remember, please seek peace if possible, but, but speak the truth at all costs.
I hope this episode of Truth at All Costs was a blessing to you and yours, whomever you choose to share it with. If you like Truth at All Costs and you want to watch the back episodes and catch up if you're new to the channel or something like that, take a look at this playlist right here. Here's all the back episodes. And if you're interested in just another video, here's my most recent reaction video, at least as I've recorded this episode. Talk to you in the next video.